people about the world, and we were at that age. And they had great questions uh, for the panelists. Um, really, really, it was a good group of, of young ladies. Uh, so I did enjoy that. Uh, that's, not having children in your house, it always helps to get in touch with young people because they seem to have a lot more to say about what should be happening in the world than you think should. So uh, those were my uh, activities, and uh, thank you. Uh, this being Black History Month, I'm looking forward to the Centaurian Luncheon, mm -hmm. which will be later this month. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then uh, this is the year of the rat, and uh, and so uh, I participated with the chief legal in the um, uh, Golden Dragon Parade in Chinatown. Uh, actually, we had two of the supervisors, uh, Solis and uh, and um, oh God, uh, um, Bart, Bart Barker. Bart, um, I always forget Bart Bart Barger. 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 and. Uh, and then Judy Chu, as usual, was also there, uh, and the mayor, of course, uh, likewise participated. And uh, and it wasn't uh, as well attended as uh, most of our Golden Dragon parades because uh, it was really hot that day. And it was interesting; the crowd was uh, anywhere there was shade, you'd see a lot of people clustered, and uh, and anywhere there wasn't any shade, uh, it was totally empty. So. Uh, but uh, but nevertheless, it was a great parade. Excellent. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I, too, want to uh, congratulate Chief Roy Harvey on his retirement and uh, thank him for his 42 years of incredible service to this department. Uh, Retiring at uh, the rank of assistant chief it was nothing short of extraordinary. So that was that was pretty. I couldn't go to the dinner, but I did make it to the fire prevention bureau's luncheon, which was also very nice. Um, I too went to the women's uh, young mentorship program at the Getty House, and it was pretty fantastic to see so many young women so excited to come over and you know go to the LAFD table. There weren't, you know, there were, there weren't a lot of people tabling, so we got a lot of them. So it was pretty, and they left really excited. I had women coming up to me, young women coming up to me, saying, "I want to join. You know, how do I do this?" And, you know, and then that leads me to, um, I went to the expo. I went a little early, uh, so, uh, and seeing, I think they had 2,400 people signed up. And just seeing the, just the caliber of people who came in was also extraordinary. And I want to commend the recruitment division. It was diverse. Everyone was excited. I want to uh, shout out for having the computer programs there, the computer stations there that people had access. They could apply right then and there. And it's just really great to see so much support and mentorship. Great. So thank you. Okay, so moving on to announcement meetings and events from the fire chiefs. Thank you, Madam President. On February 5th and 6th, we had our first ever Everyone Goes Home Symposium, and that was an idea that we thought of about a year ago to benefit uh, firefighters from throughout the region. It was free. It was co-hosted by our union, UFLAC, and all the other unions as well, LA County Union, uh, Long Beach, Aventura, uh, LA City Fire, LA County Fire, Ventura County, um, and Long Beach all joined forces to make a free presentation to all our firefighters, whoever wanted to come. Over two days, we had about uh, 350 people. We talked on three topics. The first one was the Underwriters Lab firefighting studies using science to um, inform us how we should be fighting fires today not based on old science, but new science. The second topic was our cancer prevention efforts. Cancer is a major killer of firefighters, uh, active and retired, and uh, we've got to do more in that area. We're doing a lot, and I want to set the path for the fire service as a whole to follow. The third area is, uh, was uh, firefighter mental health, 
and we heard presentations from multiple fire departments on what they're doing. Uh, that's another area that we need to work harder to uh, take care of our people to ensure that they have um, sound mental health. On February 11th, we had a fast response vehicle press conference with Mayor Garcetti at Hodgkins, and we showed off our four FRVs that are now fully staffed on a 410 schedule. Um, they're very unique uh, apparatus. Uh, I talked to the members assigned to uh, fast response vehicle 64. The day before, they had run 18 calls. Uh, they are also our tactical EMS uh, certified members. They can integrate with LAPD SWAT. If they need a SWAT uh, medical component, they are uh, readily available. They're also trained up to transport to alternative destinations, so they can also go to uh, sobriety centers or mental health clinics instead of the emergency room. So now we have one FRV in each of our four bureaus. So that was a big step for us. That same week, we made a press release announcing the purchase of the first electric fire engine in North America. We'll be fourth in the world behind uh, Berlin, Amsterdam, and Dubai. We expect delivery in December of this year. That'll be an exciting uh, acquisition, and right now we're planning on putting it at Fire Station 82 in Hollywood. We also have had a uh, corporate sponsor um, donate the charging infrastructure at Fire Station 82. So we're working on that right away so that when we get the engine, the charging structure is in place. And lastly, I did attend the retirement dinner for Chief Harvey. Over 400 people attended. Uh, Chief Hogan was the MC. He did an outstanding job. As you can imagine, trying to manage over 400 people who had a lot of good things to say about Chief Harvey. He made a, human, a, a huge impact in, in our Fire Prevention Bureau, him and Chief Crowley have really developed a, a very effective team, and, and they're doing a lot of great things. That concludes my report. Thank you. Uh, now, for I, report, may I make it just since the chief reported on it? It would be nice to uh, hear about the different things that are happening in our department before I see it on TV. So if, when they send out a press release, could they... I mean, all the work is good, but as a fire commissioner, I would like to know, because people think I know, and I don't. We can <laughs> we can make that happen. We'll make sure whenever we do a press release, we'll send uh, emails. Maybe just concurrently when you send it yep. to the press, you send it to the commission. Absolutely. Yes, that will be good. Uh, Verbal report for the department on significant incidents and activities for January 21 to February 17th. Good morning, Chief. Good morning. Madam President, Commissioners, Chief Trazes, Julie, and Leticia, I'm Deputy Chief Ronnie Villanueva, Operations South Bureau. On Friday, February 7th, at two, uh, 2020, at 2 o'clock in the morning, LFT resources were dispatched to a structure fire located at 8686 West Venice Boulevard. That's 58th 1st, 10th Battalion 18. Upon arrival, they found a two-story center hallway residential hotel doing business as the Venice Hotel which was being used for permanent residents. First arriving resources identified fire showing from one unit with extension into the first floor hallway. The fire quickly extended to the second floor through the interior stairwell closest to the front entrance of the building. There was significant heat damage in the unit of origin and the hallways on both floors. Occupants exited the building from the rear stairwells as well as from the windows on the first and second floor. Throughout the firefight, a total of six patients were encountered and treated by LAFD resources. One LFD member sustained minor breathing complications following the knockdown of the fire. Unfortunately, one civilian occupant of the residential hot hotel who resided in the unit adjacent to the fire unit was found deceased in the hallway on the first floor. A great alarm assignment extinguished the fire in approximately 39 minutes. Currently, the fire investigation is complete and the cause has been determined accidental. And luckily, the smoke detectors were working. Uh, if they were not working, it would have been much, much worse. So uh, LFD incident information, it's, it was incident 108 on uh, 7th of 2020. Uh, incident address 8686 West Venice Boulevard. 911 call came in at 2.04 in the morning. First dispatch was at 2.05. Total call processing time was a minute and nine seconds. Uh, one, the first unit on scene arrived at 2.10. So the response time was 4 minutes and 21 seconds. So we got there on time very quickly. LFT resources, 22 companies, 7 rescue ambulances, 
The specialty companies was arson, heavy rescue, and USAR were used for rapid intervention companies. Uh, the PIO emergency air. There were seven command teams that were there, uh, EMS 9, 11, and 1. Uh, as I had mentioned earlier, there were six civilian uh, patients, five critical, uh, five stable, I'm sorry, and one critical, one firefighter injury, and one civilian fatality. The inv investigation is complete. The cause is accidental. Fire appears to have originated in Unit 11. Most probable cause is ordinary combustion's close proximity to an electric space heater. Uh, and then LA, uh, the LA corner was there. So that ends my report, unless you have any questions. Thank you, Chief. <coughs> so now another uh, significant incident from West Bureau. Good morning, Madam Good President, morning. members of the Fire Commission, Chief Terrazas, Attorney Raffish, and to the management and staff of the LAFD. My name is Armando Hogan, Deputy Chief in Charge of Operations West Bureau. My purpose here today is to share with you a significant incident that recently took place in West Bureau. There will be just a very brief video with some audio, and then I'll continue. Jumpers at the window on the sixth floor. 5495, Roger, come up on channel 9. Yeah, that's what can you attach, 5492 to the incident. Structure fire had a set incident. Arrest you 37, get on your PA, tell that person not to jump. He's not in dire straits, tell him not to jump. Reported structure, airborne assignment for air op, rescue 92, engine 81, light force 73, light force 69, command 42, engine 26, engine 69. Engine 61, engine 109, engine 41, light force 88, engine 51, engine 67, engine 68, engine 99, light force 27, light force 78 to 26, structure fire assignment high rise, possible jumpers, attack channel is 12 and 16, 1, 2, 1, 6. Yeah, here's terrible. Metro from Command 42. Where did you go? I'm on scene, Barrington IC. I have a well-established working residential high-rise fire on the fifth floor. I have about 10 units well involved, heavy smoke. I'm going to start placing aircraft on the roof to assist with any evacuations. Uh, we have significant resources coming in. Uh, I'd like to see if you can activate Area A resources as well. I'll give you a further update here in a bit. Battalion 9 will be operations. Command 42 will be IC. Roger, Battalion 9 off. Metro uh, Fire 4, Helco. Uh, yeah, uh, Metro, we've got uh, civilians on the roof. Fire 1 is in the process of lowering uh, medics down now. We're going to shuttle the uh, victims or the uh, civilians over to the helipad at the BA. So if we can have an engine company there for security. IC from truck 69. We got engine 37 doing fire attack in stairwell one, which is the north stairwell, on floor seven. Light force 69 is going to go on floor eight, which is the floor above. Evacuations happening from nine above. For right now, I'm sending them up for sheltering in place on the top floor. Okay, we're going to shelter in place above two floors above the fire, and uh, we're going to call the fire floor seven. Copy that. Also, Paul, what I want to do is I want to start thinking about some aggressive fire attack. I want to think about closing all those doors to the fire floor, maybe doing in Hey, no, 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 I want to make a point about the smoke coming. Come here. They're talking to Reed on the phone. I want to look at the smoke. That's why they're so concerned. There's smoke coming out of the top of the 20. Damn it. No, well, I, I want to show you something. This, this really tells the story. And as we watch uh, another hoist here. A firefighter just came out of that stairwell at the top, and as soon as that firefighter opened up the roof, that's on the, uh, the top of the 20... Metro from Barrington, I.C. There goes the firefighter. Barrington, I.C., go. I'm just giving you an update here. We're still in the offensive mode. Uh, we're going to initiate a uh, transitional attack on the uh, sixth floor. Uh, we're continuing to do uh, rooftop evacuations with our aircraft. We still have about a 40 mile an hour wind out here. Uh, medical resources are in place. Uh, Chief Poyer is on scene. Chief Ogan is the agency administrator. I'll give you a further update here in a bit. Thanks for the support. This is Command 2, Chief Poyer. We have a knockdown here. Uh, 
be transitioning to medical needs and rehab. And As you saw on the morning of Wednesday, January 29, 2020, at roughly 0837 a.m., Operations West Bureau Resources responded to 11740 West Wilshire Boulevard. This was incident 421. The first resources on scene found a large 25-story residential high-rise with heavy fire showing on the seventh floor with residents on the balcony contemplating jumping to the ground below. The fire was reported by Light Force 95, who was returning from a previous fire just around the corner on San Vicente Boulevard. Of huge concern was a potential life hazard in this building as it was difficult to determine where the occupants were on that floor. After our resources gathered and gained situational awareness, we were able to address all of the incident concerns and best address the tactical priorities. LAFD crews made an aggressive attack on the fire while simultaneously evacuating the residents on the fire floor while sheltering in place those who were a safe distance from the intense flames. Roughly 300 firefighters battled and suppressed the fire, and a knockdown was declared at one hour and 19 minutes later. A shelter was set up at the Westwood Recreational Center for the displaced residents as we partnered with the building's homeowners association to keep the residents updated on our next steps and to ensure their needs were being met. There was one civilian fatality, and the LAFD transported seven other patients, including the decedent. Two firefighters were injured and transported to a local hospital to receive care. This was a difficult and challenging incident that our firefighters were able to address through perseverance and a willingness to confine this fire to the floor of origin. This fire remains under investigation. This concludes my report. I'll take any questions that you may have. Well, first of all, great job by everybody on that incident. It was amazing that you didn't lose, you know, any, any lives there. So, um, so good job. Um, wasn't this one of the, this is one of the buildings that's um, in that gap between requirements for sprinklers? Right. This building was uh, built in 1959. So from 1960 to 74, uh, because of that, it was built prior to 1960. So there were no uh, sprinklers in that facility. We have what we call wet standpipes and also smoke detectors, but for the most part, there were no sprinklers in that building. We also had a previous fire there in 2013. Right. So. Right. So I remember after the 2015, we took some action in the board to sort of close the gap. And so maybe we can agendize that again so that, yeah, so for, so we can have that discussion again. Because mm -hmm. I, I know that we did pass it and then it never got enacted, so let's sort of revisit it. Absolutely. Fire prevention is in the process of working uh, on that. There's about 55 of those that are still in Operations West Bureau, so we're partnering with that. There were some other things beyond our control that kind of right. held that up, but no. and we won't get into that here. But, uh, however, we are still looking at that. That's what we call our lean forward to make sure that we can make this a preventable measure right. in the future. So, I mean, my concern is that we did try to take action. Absolutely. And, you know... We, we never closed it for whatever reason beyond our control, but, it, you know, it's back on us again. So we're going to try to do it. Okay. Yes, ma'am. All right. Thank you. Oh, thank I, you I, all. I had, uh, at first, I want to commend your department, your team of firefighters from everywhere because there were so many. Right. But um, the operation ran smoothly, and you saved so many lives, and we watched it with bated breath on television minute by minute. It was, uh, and the, it was good. Um, I heard some of the, I don't know if it was a lady or a couple of people saying that there, they didn't know the plan for evacuate, for leaving the plate premises. There was no plan. Uh, there was no, uh, for them to, and I was, remember we talked about this a bit before about high rises and that there was a team plan. Somebody on the floor is supposed to know how to do something or something. Uh, to help to evacuate the people, but they said they had no plan for this particular building. I know that's not your shop, that's right. fire prevention, but... You're, you're talking it, about the floor warden program. Yes. Mm -hmm. they, she, the tenants were saying there was no... They knew they were not aware of any plan. Well, one of the things that we are working with that uh, occupancy now and the surrounding occupancies is to make sure that they're clear. What is that plan? We're going to assist in putting that plan in place. We understand now that we really have to uh, step forward in terms of giving them leadership and direction 
So we'll partner with that homeowners association to make sure that those things are on board, and that's taking place as we speak. The beauty of it, uh, Commissioner, and I appreciate your, uh, your complimenting our department. What really took place was what we call sudden change, meaning our resources just so happened to be making a left turn down Barrington coming from San Vicente and Wilshire. And just to see our folks with equipment off the apparatus, other folks making transit to go back to their respective quarters and now have this fire jump out without being in dispatch like we normally would and really having to do this on the fly was simply extraordinary. And it's just a testament uh, to the training and the discipline of our members. And that's not the only high-rise fire you had in your area. Wasn't there another or two? Well, there was another one, but it was at the ground level. There was oh. just some uh, wrapping around the building that we addressed. And it then we had one the other building. day. There was, it was a different building. On, that was on the San Vicente. Okay. Yes. So it looks like we really need to look at those high-rise plans and make sure that the tenants know what they're supposed to do. They were just lucky in this particular instance, I think. Thank you very much. Thank Keep you all. Good work. Thank you. Uh, report by the medical director for the same time period for medical emergencies. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. Dr. Mark Eckstein, EMS Bureau Commander. Significant EMS incidents since our last meeting. I think these underscores the all hazards approach of our department and the benefit of having uh, dual function firefighter paramedics after the amazing heroics we just saw, as explained by uh, Chief Hogan. Uh, we had a uh, multi-casualty incident on February 6th, which underscores the uh, scourge of homelessness and substance abuse that's pervasive uh, throughout many parts of the city. In the fire station 64's first in in the Watts community, we responded to uh, three patients who were down in uh, respiratory arrest. Uh, we sent multiple fire companies and uh, paramedic ambulances, and fortunately, due to uh, uh, extremely, extremely well-performed a medical intervention, uh, all three individuals who were not breathing and unconscious upon uh, arrival of our members were able to regain uh, uh, their, their vital signs and were delivered to the hospital uh, stable, awake, and alert. But this uh, tragic incident underscored some of the challenges facing us throughout the city right now. Uh, three other incidents to briefly highlight uh, also underscore, as I've mentioned in previous meetings, the importance of having a very robust chain of survival. As you know, um, each link of, of the chain must be strong in order for someone to survive. Uh, and these were three very young individuals who collapsed with uh, sudden death. And due to the strength of uh, each link in the chain of survival, uh, first and foremost, with uh, bystanders recognize, recognizing there's an emergency, contacting MFC. Uh, we have a very robust uh, training program and certification program for our dispatchers using the tiered dispatch system, where they rapidly uh, confirm the address. Uh, they dispatch resources as quickly as possible. We try to get the uh, call processing times under 60 seconds, and then immediately go towards providing emergency instructions to engage the bystanders to perform uh, chest compression only CPR. And uh, that was particularly uh, robust in each of these three saves. Uh, first one was on February 2nd. Uh, Truck 11 and uh, Rescue 13 responded to a 29 year old female who was uh, reportedly unconscious. Our, again, our call taker provided CPR instructions prior to arrival of Life Force 11, and the combined efforts of basic and advanced life support, uh, they were able to achieve, uh, achieve return of spontaneous circulation on this uh, young 29-year-old woman who was then transported to the nearest STEMI receiving center. On uh, February uh, 7th, uh, in uh, South LA, Engine Rescue 33 responded to a 26-year-old male initially reported to have seizure activity. And one of the uh, tenets of our tier dispatch system is that when someone is still seizing, it's a uh, cardiac arrest until proven otherwise. Call taker rapidly uh, dispatched this as an immediate dispatch, provided uh, uh, emergency instructions for chest uh, compression only CPR. And again, due to combined efforts of uh, everybody in the chain of survival, uh, our members were able also, also able to achieve a return of spontaneous circulation of this 26 year old gentleman who was then transported to the Aristemi Receiving Center. On uh, February 11th, in the uh, Hollywood area, Engine and Rescue 82 responded to a 40-year-old male uh, found unconscious by his spouse. Again, each link of the chain was uh, strong, and the combined efforts of everybody involved also uh, resulted in a, uh, achieving return of pulses in the field. Uh, and this gentleman was transported to the nearest STEMI receiving center. And finally, uh, last week on February 13th, uh, Engine and Rescue 57, you know, again, uh, some of our busiest resources in the city, uh, responded uh, again on a 29-year-old female who uh, was unconscious after having uh, witnessed seizure activity and after um, uh, very intense uh, basic and life support efforts, 
they were able to not only uh, achieve return of spontaneous circulation on this young woman, but she arrived at the STEMI receiving center uh, awake and alert and underwent placement of internal, internal uh, defibrillator when it was discharged home. So these underscore uh, sudden cardiac arrest could affect people of any age, including very young people. And uh, we're fortunate in the city of L.A. that we have uh, very robust uh, links in the chain of survival to result in these phenomenal saves. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> we're at presentations now, and I think we have, we have one. Good morning, Madam President, Fire Commissioners, morning, Chief Terrazas, Attorney Radfish, Ms. Gomez, Eric Scott, Captain 2, Public Information Officer. As Dr. Eckstein just mentioned, there was a multiple cardiac arrest uh, survivors over the recent past, and we have another excellent example of this today. And we're going to recognize a team of firefighters that saved a man's life that dropped dead at a car wash in August of 2018. At this point, it would be uh, nice to have these members to please stand near the podium. Be Captain Kenneth Codaro, Firefighters Garrett Wasserman, Scott Cleland, and Richard Othon. Now, to paint the picture a little bit for this incident, it took place approximately a year and a half ago. It was a time period similar to right now, a typical sunny day in South Los Angeles, when a 43-year-old male decided to drive his car to a local car wash. Now, while he was there and he was standing, he started to tell bystanders he wasn't feeling very well. Then he suddenly collapsed on the ground dead. Fortunately, a nearby civilian who recently learned CPR just two weeks prior started a chest compression. So he jumped in and played that critical role, um, uh, giving that link of survival. So then when our firefighter paramedics arrived on scene, they did find the patient pulseless in agonal respirations. They took over CPR. They placed an airway adjunct in that patient's mouth. They began uh, breathing for him with a bag valve mask and oxygen. And then the patient's initial heart rhythm was a lethal ventricular fibrillation, just a quivering of the heart. These members recognized that immediately. They appropriately shocked that patient's heart with 200 uh, joules of electricity. They resumed two minutes of CPR, and at that point, they continued to uh, breathe for him, and they then were able to check his um, heart rhythm again, and it was determined that, in fact, uh, he had a return of spontaneous circulation. Uh, at that point, then, they uh, began to uh, transport him to a local hospital, and often that's where our, our stories will end with these patients. But we wanted to take a, a minute more and not just gloss over the continued critical steps that are really required by this skilled team to successfully keep a patient alive. So just to mention a few, at that point, they have to perform a 12-lead EKG on the heart to get a much closer look. At that point, they determined it was in a, what we call sinus tac, which is a much better rhythm. So then they adjust their actions appropriately. They look at things like capnography that will monitor the concentration of carbon dioxide in the respiratory system. They look at SpO2, which is the oxygen in the blood. And then they would start a, an IV like normal, but this individual had poor vascular access. So they actually started an inner osseous IV, meaning they took a metal needle, put it into the tibia of the left leg to give the needed uh, drugs in the event he went back into cardiac arrest. And then they transported to the appropriate STEMI center. So th actions continued to go on to make sure that this fragile patient was successful. Um, we did get an update on the patient, so we're happy to say that uh, that patient is doing well. We received an email from them. But at this point, we would say, don't take our word for it. We are honored to have uh, Mr. Isaac Diaz to be able to walk in, the cardiac arrest survivor, and he can meet uh, his rescuers here. Earlier we saw the dramatic rescue from the high-rise fire at the Barrington Plaza. And this, this incident that uh, was described as well had uh, equal impact. We saved a life. You can't put a value on a human life. 
Uh, I'm tremendously proud of the men and women of our department. Every day uh, they handle about 1,350 calls each 24-hour period. And during the course of those calls, we have uh, runs like this where we're successful and runs where we're not. Uh, it's, it, we should celebrate these types of victories. Uh, I think it's uh, good for the morale and the mental health of our people. They know that uh, there are times we can be successful. It kind of offsets the times that we can't. And we know now that, uh, that we need to do more to support our mental health of our people. So, Mr. Diaz, having you here is outstanding for uh, our people to know that their efforts can be rewarded by survivors like yourself. Dr. Eckstein talked about the chain of survival. In this case, everything worked. And because it did, Mr. Diaz is here with us today. And uh, I can't be more proud of the members of Fire Station 15. And I'm very, very grateful that uh, Mr. Diaz was able to join us here today to join in celebrating the hard work and achievement of our people. And with that, I would like to turn it over to the captain from 15. He would like to say a few words. Good morning. Uh, Ken Cordero. I actually work at Fire Station 64. Uh, that day I was working an overtime day. And uh, it speaks to the professionalism of the crew that's there, that somebody can come from an outside station, and I know and I'm comfortable with the people that I come in and I work with. And they do perform well. They do it every day. They're a very, very busy station. And you, sir, uh, if you, you couldn't have picked a better street corner to have a cardiac arrest that day. Uh, there was a uh, – yeah, you, 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 went, you went right instead of left maybe. I don't know what you did, but – the, uh, the young man that was there that day, uh, when I, we arrived, he was doing um, – I remarked to the, to the guy, I said, man, that guy's doing some really good CPR. And it was a, a young man, doing, like I said, doing compressions. Um, and I spoke to him afterwards as we were loading you up. And I said, uh, you know, you did a real good job. I, I want you to know that what you're – you know, proper what you were doing. And he said that's when we found out that uh, it was only two weeks prior. He had actually just completed a course in uh, CPR. So, as I said, whatever brought you to that street corner that day, that confluence of events came together, and I'm glad to see you standing here. So, thank you very much. I, I, how do you thank the people that saved your life? I mean, you not only saved my life, but I'm married, so you impacted my wife. I have two boys, 16 and 14. You impacted them. Um, this past Friday, my mom passed away, and I got to do something that I wanted to do. I'm her only child, so I got to bury her. She didn't get to bury me. So that's the kind of that's what you guys do. You guys do that on a daily basis, and you guys touch lives on a daily basis, and it trickles. So from the truly from the bottom of my heart, <laughs> I appreciate everything. <laughs>
Okay. Um, for the consent agenda, just a couple of quick changes to move. Um, one is move to uh, continue uh, 4E. Um, I'd like to um, have, I'm going to hold 4D. I'd like to get a little more information on that. So I'm moving items, uh, moving the recommendations oh. on items Excuse 4. Me before you move, I oh, sorry. Um, 20-011 and 20-013 have a question. You got it. 11 and 13? So H and I. H and I. Okay. Okay. So I'll go ahead and move then items 4A, C, F, and G. Uh, adopt the, move to adopt the recommendations. And, continue e. and we'll be continuing E and uh, tabling, uh, I guess B is being withdrawn. No, no, it's 4E. Being oh, it's B. Oh, so B is okay. Yeah. B is okay. Oh, sorry. My mistake. Sorry. It's just 4E. 4E is being continued. Four One e. more time, okay. uh, moving to adopt the recommendations for items A, B, C, F, and G, and to continue item E. Yeah. All in favor? Okay. Oh, we got a second. second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so we're hearing 4D. Yes. Which is the report by the department on the First Amendment agreement uh, with Saman Kashani, MD for medical oversight regarding the implementation of telemedicine. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Dr. Mark Eckstein, uh, EMS Bureau Commander. Um, as you're probably aware, we're uh, embarking on implementing a, a telemedicine program as a pilot uh, this year in our continuing efforts to uh, decrease unnecessary ambulance transport to emergency departments to free up our resources for life-threatening emergencies. Uh, we've uh, gotten funding through the Mayor's Innovation Fund to hire uh, providers to, uh, to actually handle the calls. And uh, this contract is to hire a uh, part-time physician as an independent contractor to help provide uh, medical oversight for this program. As you might imagine, a program like this is, is extremely complex and uh, involves a great deal of medical legal risk. So we need someone with a dedicated uh, expert with expertise uh, to uh, spend dedicated efforts to help us build this program, uh, vet and hire qualified telemedicine providers, and build a robust program uh, training for the field members and battalion where we conduct the pilot and have a uh, comprehensive quality improvement and uh, quality review program. Uh, Dr. Kashani uh, is board certified in emergency medicine. Uh, also completed a emergency medical services fellowship. He's board certified in emergency medicine and emergency medical services. Uh, he spent a year with us after his residency, so he's intimate, intimately familiar with department operations. And he's working uh, to help me and my team uh, build this telemedicine program, which we're very excited about implementing later this year. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about this uh, contract. Uh, okay, so I understand this is just an extension of a contract. Did we, did we approve this contract earlier? We're at the, the, yes, the, the short one. That yes, was earlier. I think well, we, the, we approve all contracts. Right. I don't know if there was a – is there a threshold under which contracts can be like a below? They all can be. No matter how big they are. Okay, great. All right, so, so just um, – I, I think we're just a little behind the curve in understanding what's going on with some of the some of the innovations in the department, including the telemedicine. I know you can't give that right now, mm -hmm. um, but uh, since this is the second – you know, extension, obviously the program is taking root. So um, if we could get a, a, a more thorough update on what telemedicine programs, because that was a switch, I think, from what we understood was happening before. Um, I don't think we've had really a complete explanation of how the program is going to work. Um, I could be wrong, but do, do we get You might be figuring that out, too. Yeah. Right? Yeah, there are a couple of things. Just for point of clarification, the reason this the contract had to be extended, uh, it was not – approved until very recently, and therefore, by the time it was finally executed, it was almost at its end expiration date. 
So it was approved a few months ago for 12 months, and here we are having to extend it. Uh, I'm happy to come back and present uh, an overview of our telemedicine program, but as Commissioner, uh, uh, as Commissioner President mentioned, uh, this program is very much very dynamic, very fluid. We're trying to make this, obviously, it's all framed around patient safety, number one, and operational efficiency, number two. Uh, Chief Terrazas and I visited uh, Houston Fire Department last year. They're the only, first and only department in the country that has a uh, functioning telemedicine program. So we're looking at best practices, and we're working with stakeholders uh, inside and outside the department to make sure the program is safe and effective, and um, have to come back and present an overview prior to implementation. So the program is not running yet? No, sir. Okay. Um, all right, so yeah, if, if you could come back with that overview, and then we've been talking about a couple other things. Um, I know the alternative destination, um, so it would be great if you could wrap all that stuff together, and maybe we could just get a comprehensive up update on what some of these new innovations are, so uh, we, we just have a little more sense of what's going on with that. Too. Great, thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, move to uh, adopt the recommendation for item 4D. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So now 4H is report by the department on the acceptance of grant funds for the 2019 Port Security Grant Program in the um, amount of uh, $299,000 mm -hmm. for the I, Marine Firefighter Training. I'm, I'm happy to see that the department's getting grant money. That's really good. Okay. But I noticed that there was matching funds. Did, was that budgeted? Or do, where does that where does matching funds come from? Is that out of our budget, current budget? Commissioner, uh, similar to the uh, Port 18 grant, we'll be using uh, bet funds for this, so we'll get be getting reimbursement on on the 25% uh, cost share. Using what kind of funds? Vet funds. Okay. Vocational education training funds. So then we only have to provide 25% of the <coughs> we're, we're, we're Yes, that's correct. We'll be reimbursed for 75% of the grant. Oh, okay. Oh, that's good. That's good. So, and how many uh, firefighters one and twos will be uh, trained? That's going to vary on the contract. Uh, Chief, uh, one way, but do you have any insight on that? <coughs> oh, I see. Okay. So, and these are people who are currently working in the harbor area already? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. And we're marrying port 18 and port 19 together, so they're going to. The contract is going to start uh, in um, July of next of this summer, so be training hand in hand with each other. Okay. 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 Very good. Thank you. Okay. Any other okay. questions? Yeah. Those were questions I had. Okay. Thanks. So, uh, do you need four eyes of report by the department on the don't? Oh yeah, that's right. Move Sorry. to adopt the recommendation for item 4H. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So four eyes report by the department on the donation from the Paul George Foundation valued at $4,712 for 200 shadow buddies and 75 child-sized capes and masks to the LAFD. My question was just what are shadow buddy buddies and what kind of capes and masks are these and what are they used for at what time? So the department was contacted by the Paul George Foundation, Paul George uh, uh, basketball player for the Clippers. And uh, from personal experiences, as he was growing up, he was um, had an experience where he was given a stuffed animal or something like that by the paramedics when he came. they came out to help him as a child. Now that he has his own foundation, he started this in Oklahoma City where he played before he came to L.A., where he has these uh, Paul George Shadow Buddy dolls that are intended to give to children as we respond to their needs uh, when we go out on ambulance calls. The capes and masks are also there to support the kids that are going through a traumatic experience by calling 911. Oh. So the donation process, uh, LA County Fire and LA City Fire accepted donations. We accepted 200 of the dolls to disperse throughout the city from rescue ambulances. Uh, Command 22 was there with Rescue 810 after one of the recent games, and we accepted the donation there. Um, and L.A. County has it along their squads as well. well and will we be doing the uh, Staples giveaway? Will the, the fire department be doing the Staples giveaway? I oh. noticed that all 200 are coming to the fire department, but the uh, leftovers, he said, he wanted them to distributed at Staples Center. I believe Staples is handling that on our own, uh, on their own. Uh, our only participation is on our emergency calls, 
uh, when the members find children in, in, in need on some of the calls, we go on to use a supportive mechanism um, to help the kids through the uh, calls that are going on at oh, the time. That's a cute idea. Thanks. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, move to adopt the uh, recommendation for item five, uh, four I. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So now the first regular agenda item is the verbal report for the Department on Operation Stealth Bureau. <coughs> Good morning once again, Commissioners, Madam President, Good Chief Terrazas, Julie, Leticia. Um, before we get started on uh, the presentation, I would like to recognize the members of my staff who did the majority of this work, or I should say, all of the work. Mm -hmm. So if there's if there's anything you don't like about it, then we're gonna we're gonna point at them. But but no, on a serious note, uh, if they if they would, uh, Chief Mendoza, would you stand up, please? He's Marine Operations. We have our management analyst, Lori Scroce. Mm -hmm. Secretary Hello. Erica Cabrera. Hello. Captain two, Stephen Marquez. Hello. And Captain one, Sloan Joseph. Thank you for coming. And so uh, that right there is Operation South Bureau. Great. So, okay, with that, we have a safer South Bureau. And as we follow along, um, I'll be mentioning the numbers, number one, two, three, and four, and then I'll be reading off, off my, my piece of paper here. But the goals of South Bureau are directed in, are, uh, in direct alignment with the goals of the department's Safer City 2.0 strategic plan. Goal number one, provide exceptional public safety and emergency service. Number one, the addition of the fast response vehicle 64, FRV 64, expanded the FRV program to provide increased medical coverage to the Watts community, uh, an area high call load and long travel distances. These resources are approved to medically clear select patients with an acute behavioral crisis or public inebriation for transport to an alternate destination rather than to a hospital emergency room. In addition, all FRVs are now certified tactical EMS units and available to support LAPD SWAT team efforts. With the establishment of AD15, OSB has also increased resource availability by providing transport to alternative patient destinations such as sober centers and mental health clinics. Number two, due to safer grant, and the support of our Commission City Council UFLAC Life Force 38 was reestablished in the Wilmington community. With the restoration of Life Force 38, an additional resource will be available to respond to day-to-day -day emergencies while also having intimate knowledge and working relationships with industrial refineries in this community. Number three, with the reestablishment of Life Force 38, Rescue 838 was strategically relocated to Fire Station 35, thus ensuring an effective deployment of resources. The relocation of 838 to Fire Station 85 was based on Firestat's uh, predictive deployment analysis. OSB EMS response times. As OSB works on strategy one, on goal one, strategy one, improving emergency response times, OSB has been able to, res uh, to maintain an average of 52 seconds for EMS turnout time in 2018 and 2019. This is eight seconds below the NFPA 1710 standard of 60 seconds that the department asked we maintain 90% of the time. OSB average EMS response time increased two seconds from 2018 to 2019. Our goal is to reach five minutes 90% of the time. OSB fire and other response times. In 2018, OSB's average fire other turnout times was 53 seconds and in 2019 it was 51 seconds. This is an improvement of two seconds. OSB's average fire and other operational response time increased by an average of one second in 2018 and 2019. The department strives to maintain an operational response time of five minutes for EMS calls and five minutes and 30 seconds for fire other calls 90% of the time. OSB accident summary. In 2019, Battalion 6 was the most effective in reducing the number of LAFD <coughs> involved traffic accidents with a decrease of two accidents in OSB. Battalion 13 had an increase of six accidents and Battalion 18 had an increase of three. In our efforts to address the number of LAFD-involved LAFD traffic accidents, OSB has instituted a battalion driving instructor on each shift, as the rest of the bureaus have, 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 also, uh, have uh, also done. And the majority of those accidents are side swipes, rear ends, broadside. Those are the things that we're, we're working on. 
Goal number two, embrace a healthy, safe, and productive work environment. OSB has provided, number one, OSB has provided frequent messaging to each battalion regarding the value of human resources, personal management, and a professional workplace environment. Number two, the reestablishment of EITs in Battalion 6 solidified the battalion command team, ensuring safety and accountability of firefighters on the fire ground. In addition, OSB has held green, uh, quarterly green cell training for each battalion command team to test their skills managing challenging incidents and their ability to effectively track resources. In 2019, OSB began collecting data to identify workplace injuries due to non-emergency activities. Tracking reported injuries. By categorizing the reported injuries, OSB has been able to isolate specific causes of injuries so we can provide guidelines to ensure greater safety of our members and reduce workers' compensation costs as the other bureaus are doing also. Goal number three, implement and capitalize on advanced technology. The Marine Operations Section was created in 2019 <coughs> at the direction of Fire Chief uh, of Chief Terrazas. Battalion Chief Joe Mendoza was detailed to Operation South Bureau January 6, 2019. Many of OSB's successes in 2019 are due to the creation of this position. In one year, Chief Mendoza has made great strides in improving the LFT's marine operations. The Marine Operations Section established fireboat district boundaries with the CAD enhancements in order to improve situational awareness and response times to marine resources in the port of LA. Working with partners, the Marine Operations Section Commander and Lori Scroce, the OSB Management Analyst, worked with the LFD Grant Section, uh, the U.S. Coast Guard, the Port of Los Angeles uh, Police Division to obtain port security grants in the sum of 299425 these funds will be used by Marine personnel to purchase state-of-the-art scuba dive mask, radar equipment, equipment for fireboats, and to offer marine training courses. And if I may add also is that um, Phil Orozco came up and reported on that, uh, and he is the facilitator of all, all of our grants in the grant unit, but as far as port security grants go, uh, Ms. Lori Scroce is the one that writes them and gets them going. So that's why we've been successful is because of uh, the Marine Operations Section Chief, in collaboration with the Harbor Department and ILWU, improvements have been made to the water side of the berths which improve LEFD response to terminals within the Port of Los Angeles. And what that is is that um, we have all of our directional signs on land, but we didn't have them in the berths on the water side. And so because of Chief Mendoza working with the, uh, the Port Department, uh, they were able to put reflective signs on the water side so that when our boats come up, they, can, they have an access point and there's someone waiting for them so that we can have a quicker response because usually the boats are much quicker when we report to the terminals than our land resources. Um, improving the safety and productivity of our work environment, the LAFD and the Port of LA are in process of repairing or providing a full replacement of all docks and gangways at each of our four marine stations. Boat 2 was placed on dry dock on July 8, 2019, after nine years. The vessel was in much need of service. Many of these needs were critical due to its ability to respond. This service has led to a complete overhaul of the vessel. The Marine Operations Section Chief established a two-year haul-out cycle of all the boats. The cycle is based on odd and even years. The cycle increases operational efficiency and reduces the overall cost to the Port of LA and to us. Goal number four, enhance LEFT sustainability and community re uh, resiliency. Assistant Chief Jamie more recently participated as a keynote speaker at the Falls Injury Prevention Symposia at Olympia Hospital where he shared data with medical professionals, members of our neighborhood councils, and members of our neighborhood empowerment regarding, regarding LEFT responses to fall injuries in our bureau, specifically those 65 years and up. We assess community safety needs and use data collection to prioritize risk and evaluate strategies that we could implement. Number two, OSB supported, supported the department's recruitment effort by hosting the first girls' camp to be held at Fire Station 40. Uh, it wasn't the first girls' camp. There's been many of those, but it was the first one that was done down at Drill Tower 40. This is in support of LAFD's recruitment efforts and the department's goal of increasing the number of female firefighters in the LAFD. Number three, a member of OSB command staff supports CERT by attending their new orientation. OSB staff has fostered community partnerships with different neighborhood organizations. Um, as focal points to increase CERT membership. CERT receives a dedicated section in OSB's quarterly newsletter, South Point, which you have before you there. 
which highlights CERT events and increased community awareness of the CERT training opportunities. OSB staff meets regularly with OSB CERT coordinator Chen Tamasangsi. I know that's hard if you read it inside the, they had to phonetically put that out for me. To identify other mediums to augment community participation in the program. Sustainability and community resiliency. OSB has partnered with MySafeLA in our efforts to improve community re resiliency, and I can see that Mr. Dave Barrett is in the crowd today, MySafeLA. In addition to the typical functions associated with MySafeLA's partnership with the LAFD, OSB has supported boat canvassing. Um, as we do our normal canvassing when we have uh, uh, structure fires, when there's a fatality, and we go out, we had a fatality in a boat, a uh, couple of them actually recently, and it was uh, MySafeLA's idea and we collaborated with them, and now we canvass the marinas to, to enhance the uh, awareness. Uh, goal number five, increase opportunities for personal growth and professional development. Marine operations in concert with UFLAC has created a letter of agreement clearly describing the scuba diver position, <coughs> training qualifications, and testing process. The department can anticipate a diver's exam before the end of the year. And that's been a long haul, and so I'd like to also, uh, uh, Freddie Escobar is in here, the president of UFLAC, and worked with us to get that MOU out there to get this, this process going. Marine operations and OSB will utilize the marine training courses discussed previously as a platform maritime academy, which will enhance personal growth and professional development while ensuring a qualified marine response force. Partnering with other agencies, Battalion 6 works closely with the LA County Lifeguards and LA County FD Battalion 14, Long Beach Fire Department, Port of Los Angeles Police, the U.S. Coast Guard, in addition, the agencies represented in Area Maritime Security Advisory Committee, AMSAC, which includes the FBI, Custom Border Protection, and other law enforcement agencies from around the, uh, our area here. OSB meets regularly with members of SCHEMO, that's a Southern California Industrial Mutual Aid organiza Organization comprised of the 13 uh, refineries and industrial agencies in the greater LA area. Battalion 13 has been meeting on a regular basis with uh, LA County FD Battalion 13 and 20 commanders to establish standard operating guidelines for mutual uh, response districts. This has improved communication, operational efficiency, and firefighter safety on scene of emergency incidents. Battalion 18 planned and hosted a brush drill in Baltimore Hills and Kennethon Park with the Area A fire agencies comprised of Beverly Hills, Culver City, and Santa Monica, also LA County, um, joined us that day. This drill solidified our relationships with each of these agencies. We published a mutual aid newsletter, which is distributed by Battalion 18 on a daily basis. Complaint tracking. OSB meets every two weeks with members of the Professional Standards Division to review and address CTS cases in OSB. The number of CTS cases, as you can see there, has gone way down since 2015, and that's when we started the Four Bureau at that time. And then successes for 2019, they're all up there on your list. It's basically what I have just gone over through this, through this presentation. Uh, this slide is a summary of OSB successes for 2019. We are very proud of these accomplishments, which could not have been possible without the relationships within the LAFD, our allied agencies, and community partners. Um, with that also, um, I can't do it without our team. And the team begins, of course, with Chief Terrazas, Chief Poyer, and all of the deputy chiefs that we meet all the time and discuss uh, to try to have a, a better department and just to be successful on a daily basis. So that concludes my report. Um, welcome any questions. You do have your newsletter in front of you and you have a challenge coin from South Bureau. And if there isn't anything further, thank you very much. Thank you oh, for the challenge, oh. Corn. Yeah, you good, you. Question? No. Good, uh, oh, you do. Okay. And good report. I almost yeah. got away. And thank you for emailing. <laughs> it, you, I get the newsletter in the email, too, so that's good. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks for the report. Thank you, sir. I don't feel like it would be dishonoring tradition if I didn't ask you a couple of questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, we are all about tradition. We're all good. So, um, just a couple quick, uh, really good report. I appreciate it. Um, looks like you, you and your team are doing a lot of really good work down there. So. Uh, generally, um, a couple of highlights just uh, worth worth commending the um, the haul out schedule is a big deal. I know that's been um, really an issue with the boats for years and years and years, and and uh, you know it, it it ended up being I think uh, perhaps penny wise pound foolish because the the costs of the haul out I know go dramatically up. Um, uh, so great that that I know that makes everybody 
happier and it's the right thing to do. So good job of getting that figured out. Um, when do we expect Boat 2 back in service? We're thinking probably about nine months from now. Gotcha. Uh, it's, it's, it's needed a lot of work, but Chief Mendoza has been going down there uh, weekly and meeting with the port and all the port partners and everyone regularly. So yeah. uh, we're always on board with what's going on. So we're hoping within within a year. That's so. right. And, and the, is the fast response boat, is that still in operation down there? Yes, we still have at uh, Fire Station 112, we have uh, boat 17 uh, in our fast response boat that are two boats that are now in, in the spot of boat two that are handling those responses. And how is boat 17? That's a permanent placement though, yeah? Uh, that one is, a, they're both loaners from the port. Gotcha. But the 17 was supposed to be, it was a kind of a pilot? Would, right. It, it was, the idea is something we might want to continue? or Right, not? if we could, yes. And how is, I don't know if we can you give some highlights on how that's going? with Well, the well actually, we're getting uh, another loaner boat. We're going to be turning one of the boats back in and bringing another boat 23, which is actually encapsulated with a pilot house. So we're basically going to still have that boat. will be uh, over at 112s for any fast response uh, mm -hmm. responses that we have in the future, even if we do give those boats back. Oh, has that been a useful addition, having that sort of it's smaller very faster? good. I think I had reported once before, but the times, yeah. it's significant. When that boat gets out there, it, it'll beat those smaller boats by uh, 15 minutes on some of our times that we, especially if we go around out of the breakwater. Yeah. When you go around to, to uh, the Palos Verdes side. Got it. It'll... It increases uh, dramatically. Yeah, I know it was one of the intentions there was for EMS responses to ports of call there. and Ports of call, the Iowa, uh, uh -huh. the, uh, the terminals that are across the yeah. uh, harbor area there when you have the UTRs have unfortunately have fallen into the water. And so that boat can get there much quicker so we can have divers on there. Okay, great. Um, just uh, kind of a, uh, you know, a lot of good successes here. Yang, congratulations on a lot of that. Um, can you say um, any thoughts on some of your operational challenges and what, what you see as sort of some of the remaining challenges your team is working on? Well, some of the challenges that we have is it's huge, and it's right in front of us is the port. Uh, the port is you have all the refineries that are there, uh, but we do have very good that the schema that I go to the schema and then also the uh, area maritime, uh, the AMSAC meeting that I uh, attend with all of the port partners. Uh, we're always training, uh, but then that's also to to uh, congratulate Chief Mendoza is that he's uh, getting a lot of the crane training, uh, refinery training, uh, hazmat training, all within that port complex, and we're teaming up with Long Beach, with the county, with the FBI, with uh, CBP, Coast Guard, all of so we're constantly. We just had a huge port protector drill, uh, where that's an annual drill that the Coast Guard has to put on. Uh, where we have a, de a demonstration or presentation on, on terrorist acts and anything that can happen within that port complex. So those are the things, the challenges that we have, that, but we are addressing them uh, all the time. And luckily that we have this, uh, this marine operations section here that has been doing a fantastic job, and that's with the guidance yeah. of Chief Tarazi. So the, the congratulations, you know, your, your turnout time is holding steady, obviously, where in a place you want it to be. Um, any any thoughts on just the overall the, the operational response time on on what what uh, what contributes to that sort of trending in the wrong direction? And I understand there are certain aspects here that are there are a lot of variables well, there. Well, some but of them we're trying to help, that, like response time as far as like accidents go. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of telling them hurry, but to slow down a little bit, and make sure you put your gear on properly, but get out of there in a reasonable amount of time. Mm -hmm. And the other thing of our decrease of times is the construction that's going on. We have the blue line. You have a lot of other road diets. You have other things that, that put in, yeah. come into play that may slow it down just a little bit. But our accidents are going down. So with that, great. It, that two seconds, yes, we want to make that look better. But on the other hand, our, we're decreasing accidents and being safer out there and keeping our people safer. Yeah, and, and without, without it being a, a reflection on how it, how it looks, it's m the question is really more about um, – you know, as a it, it's a challenge for the entire department, right? Is the overall changes in operational response time? I don't know if you had any, you know, traffic's one, that, or if there's specific areas that you see that um, contribute to that. I imagine there's certain areas where it is it's well, fine, but actually, um, well, down in uh, in South LA, you have all that area with the uh, with the railroad, all the mm -hmm. subway that you have there. So that that's one area there, and then the other is Battalion 18. Just it's just congestion, time of day. Uh, it depends. Of course, 2 o'clock in the morning, we can get there very quickly. 
but around the Grove and some of those areas down right. there where the blue line's coming in, it's very difficult at any time during the day. I mean, you can ask Miss Jenny Park on her trying to get home from work. You know, so uh, it's just it's a tough tough area. Yeah. Uh, and, and any thoughts you guys might uh, initial thoughts on ways to address that? Um, well, I think what we're doing is, I mean, it's just a natural thing. We're just trying to get out of, out of the station as quickly as possible. I know that only goes so far. Turnout only goes so far, right? And, <laughs> yeah. and being right. safe as possible. That's yeah. really about all that we can do. We, like we don't weigh, have a... Weigh in on that. The, uh, the call processing time, we're doing very well. We saved 14 seconds right out of the gate when we went to tier dispatching. And then the uh, turnout time, very well. We're faster than the one-minute NFPA standard. The biggest variable is travel time, mm -hmm. without a doubt. Uh, and you add a rainy day, and that slows us down. Or a major emergency where you tie up a lot of companies on scene, like the Barrington Plaza fire, our response times went down because we had fewer resources in the field. So what are we doing to to expedite? The um, telemedicine mm -hmm. will like eliminate. We're getting off agenda here. Okay, we'll eliminate yeah. some of the call load. Sure. So, so we're, we're coming back to you. You know, I'm, I'm going to uh, last comment, and then we'll move on, Council. I promise. Um, is is uh, is just um, look. I think the department does a does a great job on 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 the low hanging stuff, which is the turnout time and the call processing time. I know that's not. I don't mean low hanging. That's yeah. easy because it's not. I don't e think it's low hanging. It, but it's what's in our. It's what is most immediately in our control. So the stuff that is less in our control, um, we still have to figure out how to address. Yeah. I'll leave it there. Interested in coming back to that conversation, though. Um, can you just talk a little bit more about your CTS chart and what you what you think? Any thoughts on what's what do you think has helped with that? Uh, well, just I, I think what it is is that we constantly um, are mentioning our uh, expectations to our battalion chiefs. So I meet them. I meet with them monthly, uh, and so when we meet, I make sure that I always stress the CTS complaints. Mm -hmm. uh, Everything that that we have of concern at that time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just helps with ex yeah, give our the expectations and people understand what they need to be doing. Yes, what we do all the time, and make sure that that message gets out to our battalion chiefs, and uh -huh. our battalion chiefs then disseminate that information down to the troops. Okay. All right. Thank you for the report. Appreciate it. Right. Keep up the good work. Bye. Thank you. So it's just a verbal report. So if we can move on to 5B, which is report by the department. Of the Los Angeles Fire Department computed computer aided dispatch status report. The CAD. Thank you. Good morning, Madam President. Good morning. Commissioners, Chief Terraza, City Attorney, Ms. Gomez, Scott Porter, Chief Information Officer, IT Bureau Commander. Uh, back in December, the Commission asked for a report or more detailed report on the status of our computer aided dispatch system. So I've provided the report. I'll give a couple of highlights and then take any questions. Um, as you know from my report back in December, our CAD system has a 30 plus year history um, and has evolved quite a bit in those 30 years. It is a custom system that we originally built with contractors and we currently maintain in house with department staff. Um, the uh, uh, basis of the report is essentially a discussion of 2019, some of the things that we focused on, which were primarily just shoring up the infrastructure, making sure the CAD system was technically sound to uh, continue to meet our needs for the foreseeable future, at least for the next couple of years. We sort of think about things in three to five year windows. Um, we made a considerable number of enhancements, um, depending on how you count them, somewhere in 70, 75 uh, minor to moderate to some major enhancements of the CAD software. Uh, and we replaced just about all of the infrastructure. That was a project that was started in 2018 and finished up in 2019. Um, we also hired a couple of new staff members, uh, which, which in the IT world, especially in the city, can be difficult to find uh, good, talented staff. We have a particular, uh, somewhat of a unique challenge in that we want staff that are willing to learn somewhat older technology to do support roles, but also get excited about some of the new things that we're doing and finding that balance. And we were um, uh, very lucky to hire a couple of really good uh, new staff members uh, in 2019. In 2020, uh, our plan right now is really to focus in three major areas. Um, one area that we're focusing on every year is obviously just maintenance and support. We 
constantly have sort of new, um, more immediate requirements that we try to address as they come up, but also try to get work done that's on an actual plan. The three areas we'll be focusing in on 2020 is um, the one, one main area is how we manage locations. Uh, we call it address validation or location validation. Um, we're going to be basically doing a wholesale replacement. Think of it as like getting a hip replaced. It's a pretty major surgery, but once it's done, uh, it'll give us a lot of uh, capability that we don't have today. It's essentially putting our CAD system and the way we manage locations on par with how we manage locations um, uh, throughout all of our other systems in the department. Um, we're also going to be working on uh, continuing work on the fire station alerting system, which uh, we have a contract with a vendor to replace the um, most of the infrastructure uh, in the fire stations, but it also changes how the CAD system works with the fire station alerting system. So that's a pretty significant major project. And the third is uh, a little bit more bread and butter. It's just uh, upgrading all of the terminals in the um, in MFC up to Windows 10, which is a citywide Endeavor, we're, we have a project going on in the fire department with all our administrative computers. But with the CAD computers, we tend to do things last and uh, very, very cautiously. So that thing will take us all the way through the end of the year. Um, in terms of the future of CAD, uh, the future, we're still very optimistic in terms of sort of, is this the right platform for us? Um, we're constantly looking at the balance of, you know, there, there are trade-offs when you have the maintenance of this system in-house. Are we really the best, most equipped people to be doing our CAD system? We have to ask ourselves that honestly every couple of years. Right now, I think yes. Um, LAPD just finished their CAD upgrade, so we'll be looking at them, kind of seeing how they're doing. We're constantly looking at the market to see how the market is doing. Um, but uh, we continue to innovate in the area of CAD. Also, um, sort of the future is really around how we're using the CAD data. Uh, we will start a small project um, uh, to replace what we call the incident archive, which is essentially how people view CAD historical data. And part of that project, a little piece of it is uh, to start looking at some more predictive analytics. Can we actually move analysis from, you know, 2448 and historical to like real time, uh, looking at things like real time heat maps and other tools that we can give members at MFC and in, in the administration to look at how things are going in real time. So I think those will be the most innovative areas, that plus our continuation to roll out um, ABL and, uh, and how we're doing dispatch uh, with ABL. So that's the end of my report. I'll take any questions. I just got a couple quick questions on the um, the mapping. Yep. Sorry, you, you may have said this. Um, so the, the is that going to push down to the MDCs then? Yeah, so it's a it's kind of a couple of things. We have maps on the MDCs today. Right, but uh, we don't love those, right? We don't love those. Yeah. Um, there is a new version of the map that we're testing uh, for the MDCs right now, and that new version is actually the, the fire department's standard, we call it GIS, Geographic Information System, but the standard map that we use everywhere else. So this will be the first time the MDCs have actually the same map that we use to print the run books, the same map we use on our other applications. That's in test right now, and one of the enhancements of that map is real-time units that are nearby, real-time incidents that are nearby, better driving directions, things that they didn't have available to them before. Okay. So that is a project by itself. That's separate from the project that we're doing to enhance CAD and how we manage addresses. Gotcha. But the, that, um, that map enhancement will be finished What's the timeline to finish that on? Uh, probably the summer. We'll okay. start deploying it. We're testing it now, and we'll start deployment of it probably sometime in the summer. Great. Yep. Um, and then fire station alerting. Um, so, so I just I've lost track of where, <laughs> where we are with yeah. it. So 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 uh, great. You've completed the the sort of infrastructure piece, which I know was a, a big yep. step there. Are we actually funded to get the new off-the-shelf system yet, or that is still pending? No, we are. So um, uh, very quickly, a little bit of history. There was an RFP five, six years ago, came back $25, $30 million price tag, and everyone said, well, it's nice, but that's not going to happen. Um, so we uh, did some market research. We sort of thought, you know, hey, 
12 million is probably do it for us. We asked for 12. I think that first year was 17, 18, we got a million. So we said, okay, well, what can we do with a million bucks? So the very first thing we did, and this is almost complete, it's about 90% done, is we replaced all of the telephone network that goes out to each of the fire stations with city fiber. So that was sort of 17, 18, um, or eight, maybe 18, 19. And then in the next budget, we asked for, I think, 5 million, got 3 million, and that was to replace basically the computer equipment that's in each of the fire stations that actually does the alerting and the computer equipment that does the automated voice. That's sort of the next level of the guts of the system. We did, ha we have a contract, there is a company under contract and they're working and that will replace our next most vulnerable piece which is all these old boxes that are in the fire station and uh, that'll take us through 2020 and we haven't in this year's budget ask asked for anything because that's going to take us a year to finish and sort of settle in on. Once that's done, we will then have a completely new platform for fire station alerting and that's where we can start talking about how can we enhance alerting inside the station for, you know, more configuration of the bells and alarming and different rooms yeah, getting different the, signals and all of that sort of stuff. We now have a platform we can do all of that. The fire chief and I had talked about things like controlling the doors at the time of an earthquake, turning things on and off. And I mean, we'll have the capability to do all of that. And I think once we understand sort of what's the next problem we want to solve with fire station alerting, that's when we'll make another budget request. But right now we're just, you know, one one thing at a time. Got it. But it's, it seems like the path is away from a, uh, removing fire station alerting out of the CAD entirely and going towards a third party and instead yeah, actually so trying to... we have to a little bit of a hybrid now. So the original, the, what we're replacing was, I mean, the boxes were literally built and supported by ITA. They have mm -hmm. guys on soldering benches fixing them. So that's all going to be replaced with a commercial off-the-shelf vendor that does major fire departments, Got FDNY, Houston, Got and it. Chicago, right? So that part is commercial off-the-shelf. So when we want to add new types of alerting, we want to add stuff, we're buying it from them. Our piece, which is how we integrate and control that, we'll be doing on our end. And we're even doing things with them because it's you know a custom CAD, they've never really done before like the way we control their fire station alerting system. Mm -hmm. So it's a hybrid of a completely removed versus. Does it better, it, it, should there be a time, and I know this is a very much another question, but should there be an eventuality where we actually decide to replace the entire CAD system with a, an off-the-shelf system? Um, does the work you're doing now, is that going to allow us to make that decision more easily if we need to? Because I think one of the issues before was because Fashion One was so integrated into the CAD, yeah. there, it, it actually uh, actually was was a major obstacle to any kind of a third party like an off the shelf system for CAD. I'm not saying we necessarily want to go off the shelf, but but I know that 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 was something that actually prevented us from even really going on that that path too far. Yeah, there isn't anything about the fire station alerting system that would have to be replaced other than the CAD integration. Mm-hmm. I mean, so that's live, gotten – you're disentangling things a little yeah, bit. it certainly could live with another CAD because it does everywhere else. Got it. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, oh, just on, on AVL, the, uh, the, the AVL integration, can you just say a little bit more about where we are with AVL and how that's integrating into dispatching yeah. right now? So, so AVL is somewhat now in – just maintenance mode is just like TDS. We built TDS. It was a project that was, you know, sort of for a year after it was implemented, constant changes and upgrades and enhancements. And now that is uh, in maintenance mode. Mm -hmm. ABL is much the same way. Uh, really, right now, it's more operational. What types of calls and which algorithms do we move towards AVL? That's kind of a decision that we're, we deal with all the time. And then the second thing is, uh, we're implementing more broadband, which is the network that the AVL runs over. Mm -hmm. And as we get more experience with that, we'll probably get more into AVL-based dispatch. We currently, so the status is it's there. We currently support it now, and it's still on a limited number of call types where we actually use closest unit based on AVL. Got it. But as far as AVL implementation within the CAD. Yep. We're talking about AVL here. 
The word AVL is in this report. Um, <laughs> and anyways, last question. Um, but we, we have a we have a that, that as far as you're concerned, the actual guts of AVL are integrated into the CAD. Yes. Every unit's got AVL, yes. and so now it's just a question of an operational and adaptation. How, and of it. how do we want to evolve it? What's the next step uh, operationally we want to do with AVL? Okay. Yeah. Uh, what, what, when might we be able to get um, a, 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 d a deeper dive into AVL and its projected use? I guess that's both you and uh, the, the dispatch team. Uh, I don't know. Is that? Yeah. Can we talk about that sometime maybe this uh, early summer? Or? We can talk about it anytime you want. Fantastic. You just have to tell us what you want to talk about. And yeah. No, I, th I think it would, be, it would be interesting to see. You know, we, we've had AVL – really about five years now, right? Yeah. It's, um, so the question would be for a future report um, would be now that it's out there, like right, what have we learned and what is the what is the AVL plan for the, you know, the next one to three years, yep. uh, you know, to, to live up to the potential of having that capability. Mm -hmm. So okay. that would be my request for a report at some point in the next three months. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. Always appreciate your reports. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, move to adopt the recommendation for item 5B. Second. On favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Uh, we have one public comment from Mr. Danny Stevens from the Sprinkler Fitters Local 709. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I only have three minutes, or I'd ask what is AVL, but we're not going to <laughs> So I'm here to address uh, the Barrington Fire and how we got there and where we're going to go from here. So um, President Ibarra mentioned there was a commission, uh, excuse me, a report to the commission. Uh, it was dated August 18, 2017. Mm -hmm. um, that commission led to a council motion on uh, September of 2017, and unfortunately it died in committee uh, December of 2018. So now we, are, we go back to January 29, 2020, and we have another fire that kills people, injures a lot of people, costs the city a lot of money. Um, the report is an excellent report. It's comprehensive. It addresses um, evacuation routes and training of the, off the building staff. Um, I'm going to just read the summary real quick. Uh, it states, due to the recent multiple fatality fires which have occurred in several non-sprinklered high-rise buildings throughout the nation and abroad, the Los Angeles Fire Department Fire Prevention Bureau created an aggressive action plan to decrease the community's risk. The FPB took a proactive approach to immediately identify, prioritize, and thoroughly inspect all 55 non-sprinklered residential high-rises in the city of LA. These actions ensure that the current fire life safety systems are in good working order and the fire code is enforced. The action plan includes additional steps to ensure building owners and occupants are well informed of the risks and educated on fire life safety measures, including proposed retrofit from fire sprinkler systems. That would increase overall safety. LAFD historically identifies non-sprinklered high-rise buildings as occupancies that present an increased risk to the public and first responders. Modern fire protection in the form of sprinklers is arguably the best known fire protection method to assist in saving lives prior to fire department arrival. Now, moving on, there was a motion um, submitted uh, January 31st. I'm going to read a portion of that. While state regulations require fire suppression systems for all buildings taller than, may I continue for Thank a quick second? You, if you can just close it out, Absolutely. Uh, that'd be great. Yeah, so the, the motion is, there's an exemption for these buildings that was put in. We all thought well, after the first interstate aware. fire, we had it covered. Exemption for these 55 high-rise buildings, Where and they're we? still having fires. Thank you. We're going to revisit the issue, as we mentioned. Thank you so much. Oh, uh, motion to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Aye.